Part of Rooted that I got the most from was definitely the new relationships. Developing new friends. Getting to know the people that were in my group. They became my church family. Before I was afraid to connect with people, and now I couldn't imagine not having these people in my life. My relationship with God was like a little more on like the, the stagnant side. Being a part of Rooted reignited that flame for me. I had been praying, Lord, how am I going to speak to people about God? And Rooted in the book actually gave me a way to communicate. I didn't think that I knew how to pray, and I didn't think that I knew how to journal. I, w I didn't grow up Christian, but there was just always that one thing missing for me, and I think it was just like trusting God and like really relying on Him. Rooted really helped teach me more about my spirituality. I feel that I have grown in my walk with God. The material wasn't churchy. It was just every day talking. If I had to write a book, I would write it like that. Yeah. It broke me in a good way. Like it just kind of opened up wounds that needed to like just come out. And it's funny because it's like with people we didn't even know. I think that our group was perfectly handpicked by God. Being able to hear other people's stories. Their testimony, where they came from and where they are now and today, it just really uh, hit my heart. I thought I was going through a lot myself, and then you realize there's a lot of other stories that are being told around the table that are just as, as big in terms of issues and situations. It's vulnerable to uh, share who you are, but that's what it's all about. The last day there, we did words of affirmation for each other, and to think that 10 weeks ago we were strangers. And now, hearing the things we have to say about each other is truly life-changing. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit did. It's going to be a little bit awkward at first if you're not used to being in a group, but you'd get over that. Stepping out of that comfort zone and just doing it um, makes all the difference in the world. It is a commitment, but it's a very fun commitment, and you will learn a lot from the people and friends you make. It was a life-changing experience. Don't be afraid to take a leap. Just dive in. <laughs> Show up. Be yourself and be open to learning from each other and from God. Do it. You will not regret it. It is something <clears throat> that I will cherish. Man, stop playing. Try rooted and don't get booted. You feel me? I have to agree with that. Dang! Are we doing all right? Everybody good? Oh man, 1130. We can do better than that. That's my favorite service. Are we doing all right? Everybody good? Hey, uh, welcome to South Hills. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, my name is JR. I'm the campus pastor here. And if you're new to South Hills, we're so glad that you are with us uh, today. We've been in a series called The Opposite of Spoil, where we want to help really all of us have important conversations about money that we believe we all should be having. And what we want to get into today is, well, why is so much of our self-worth tied to what we have? And why do even those who have a lot oftentimes feel worthless? How do we break our addiction to more? How do we teach our kids there's more to life than having the best stuff? And if you're taking notes, the title of our message today is The Materialism Makeover. Hey, Wrigley's not bothering me, guys. He's good. You don't need to feel like you got to take him out. He's fine. Um, the Materialism Makeover. Uh, let me pray for us before we get into the message today. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is a lamp into our feet, light into our path. I pray that's exactly what it would be for us today. And right where you are, if you would just pray this with me. God, if you speak, I'll listen. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Uh, I was in fifth grade, and I got invited to a classmate's birthday party. And the invitation was a little vague. It said to dress nice and to show up at this address, which was this young lady's house. 
at this time. That's all it said. And so um, I show up to the house and see some of my other classmates, and there's some guys and some girls, and uh, we're all dressed like we're going to a dance. And honestly, I was a little confused because I was like, what kind of birthday party are we going to? And, um, and we're waiting, and all the parents are standing outside, and uh, the young girl comes outside with her parents, and we're just standing outside figuring out what we're going to do. And um, all of a sudden, the limousine pulls up, and I'm like, what is going on? Like, where are we going? And uh, the driver gets out. He's like, hey, everybody get in the limousine. And, um, and, and so we all get in the limousine, and we drive for about 20 minutes. And we, after 20 minutes, we get out of the limousine, and we're now at the arena where the Atlanta Hawks play. And I'm like, what is, what is going on? And the young lady says, we're going to a concert. I was like, okay, cool. This is my first concert. I've never been to a concert before. So we walk into the arena, and, uh, and they're taking us to this uh, suite. Her parents had got the suite, a whole suite. It had food, candy, soda, and it was all you can eat. Like, you could have as much as you wanted, and they just came back and replenished it. It was amazing. We still had no idea what concert we were at. Um, <laughs> And so the concert starts, and oh my gosh, it was Britney Spears. <laughs> this is my first concert ever. And it wasn't like, I mean, it was like the like OG Britney. Like, like hit me, baby, one more time, Britney. <laughs> right? And, um, and man, it was like, it, it was such a great show. And there's one of the things I remember the most is there was a part of the show where she's like, hey, I'm going to bring somebody up and sing to them. And can I tell you, I was trying to do everything I can to get out of that box, that suite. I'm like jumping up and down as if she could see me and as if she was going to pick a 10-year-old boy to sing a song to. And, um, and when she didn't pick me, can I tell you how disappointed I was, as if I actually had a chance? But I remember going home, and my parents were like, hey, what did you guys do? Like, you got in the limousine. What did you do? And I said, oh, my gosh, Mom, Dad, we went to a Britney Spears concert. And they had, a, they had a whole suite for us. It was full of food, candy, soda, all we could eat. They had, we could have as much as we wanted. And as I'm sharing with so much excitement, I could see the wheels spinning in my parents' heads because they're like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do for his birthday? <laughs> because in my head, the expectation for my birthday party had now been raised. Because I didn't know that a 10-year-old's birthday party, you could get a limousine, <laughs> go to a Britney Spears concert, sit in a private room, and have all you can eat food, candy, and soda, right? And the reason I share that story is what's important in that moment that I had in fifth grade. And imagine my parents, right? Imagine how difficult that was for them to navigate and manage when it came to my expectations. Now for my birthday parties moving forward, right? I can't even imagine what that cost, and nor do I believe my parents could have afforded that. But what mattered the most in that moment is that a standard had been set, and as parents, and really as people, we feel like we all have to rise to it. Regardless of where we find ourselves, we feel like now we have to rise to that standard. And then it extends way beyond birthday parties, right? None of us, uh, we don't want our kids to be the only kid that doesn't have that video game console. We don't want our kids to be the only kids that don't have a cell phone or not on social media, right? We don't want our kid to be the only kid that doesn't have all the right clothes or right shoes, right? We've all been there when we were first day of school, Right, and you got to have your outfit, you got to look fresh, right? And, and when your parents wouldn't buy you the clothes that you really wanted, you thought they were the most terrible people in the world, right? For me, that was like, Mom, I need that Sean John Velour tracksuit outfit. Ma, I need that, Ma, I need that fat farm. Ma, I need that, fat. y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Right? If you, if you, if you like me, he's like, Mom, I need that FUBU for us, by us, Ma. You know, and, and that's what it was, right? And when we didn't get what we wanted, we thought our parents were like the worst humans in the world, right? And so we've all been there, right? And, and kids are constantly navigating what sociology professor Allison Pugh, she calls it an economy of dignity. And she says, kids' feelings of self-worth often rise and fall based on constantly shifting standards around the possessions and experiences that matter in their own little worlds, 
And the pressure on us is real because the pressure on our kids is very real. And kids are constantly having to navigate this. And as parents, we probably try to shield our kids, right, from how hard uh, life is by giving them whatever they ask for or maybe a few things they did not ask for. Because watching them go without reminds us maybe how we went without and the social discomfort that comes with that. It's why we spoil our kids most in the ways uh, in whatever area was lacking for us when we were growing up, which may or may not have anything to do with what they really want or need. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. The lie we believe is that if our kids have more than we did, then they'll have it better than we did. The lie that we believe is that if our kids have more than we did, then they'll have better than we did. But more doesn't equal better. And this isn't just true for our kids, it's true for us, right? Maybe some of us feel like we need to do better than our parents and at the very least keep up with our peer group. And peer group has expanded, right, in the day and age that we live in. Peer group is not just the people that you do life with. It's now the people that you follow on social media that you don't know, but you think you know them because you follow them on social media and you see their life, right? And so we're trying to keep up with people that we don't even know. We don't even know the full story. And all we're looking at, all we're seeing is really the manufactured parts of their life. We're seeing what they want to show us, maybe not what's really happening. One expert on adolescence from Stanford University wrote that many children have privileges that were once reserved for royalty. That's how far we've come. Now everyone expects to be treated like a king. And all that is producing is people who are materialistic and entitled. People who focus on more stuff than people or relationships. People who believe that more stuff will make them happy or solve all of their problems. People who care less about the utility or functionality of their stuff and really more about how people react to what they have. People who want too many of the wrong things and compromise their values to get them. And this is what Paul was talking about in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, which says this, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. I don't believe this is who we want to be, nor do I believe this is who we want our kids to be. And the question is, how does someone end up here? Am I not supposed to give my kids a good life with nice things to make them happy? Am I not supposed to enjoy my life and treat myself and have nice things? Look at what 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 says. It says this, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. It's not that God does not want you to enjoy life or for your kids to not enjoy what they have or what you bless them with or how you show love to them. But what God doesn't want to happen is for us or our kids to have a self-worth that is dependent on what we have. And that's the danger. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Our self-worth is not dependent on what we have, but who we are in Jesus. Our kids should grow up and know that regardless of where they find themselves in life, that their life is valuable. It's meaningful, not because of what they've achieved, accomplished, or anything like that, but simply because Jesus loves them. And that Jesus has a plan and a purpose for their life that is far beyond anything they will ever dream of or imagine. Researchers tell us that spoiled kids tend to have four major things in common. They have parents who make their decisions, solve their problems, and absorb their consequences. They have very few rules that govern their behavior or schedules. They have few chores or responsibilities around the house. They have a lot of material possessions, and then they get more. And all spoiled kids don't have all four of these at the same time, but the presence of any of these uh, just increases the likelihood that they're going to wrestle with materialism and entitlement. What I find interesting is that the first three things that I read have nothing to do with money, meaning you don't have to have a lot of money to spoil kids. And for those of us who uh, don't have kids in the room or our kids are grown, just know that we too become spoiled in the same way. 
And if you're taking notes, here's our big idea today. We become materialistic when we'd rather buy something better than build deeper connections and character. That new car is not going to fix your marriage. That bigger house is not going to fix your marriage. That better ring is not going to solve the problem. And when we think that purchasing something is the answer to a problem or that it's the solution, then maybe we have to take a step back and see, man, have I become materialistic? Is my self-worth dependent on what I have, not who I am in Jesus? And this isn't just an American problem, it's a human problem. Because we see this very thing being talked about in the New Testament, and we're not just told what the issue is, but we're actually given a better way. Look at what 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1, it says this, Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, to live in a way that pleases God, not pleases your spouse, not pleases your kids, not pleases your boss, not pleases your neighbors, not pleases your coworkers, but in a way that pleases God. As we have taught you, you live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. But what does it mean? What does it mean to live in a way that pleases God, not just in the cultural context that this passage was written or spoken, but what does that mean for you and I today? Look at what verses 11 and 12 says. It says this, make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. And this is, what, this is the opposite of what culture tells us. Because many of us, we aren't living quiet lives anymore, given everything that's in front of us, right? We, we post about everything we do. We share about everything we do. And some of us are probably even bragging about everything that we get to do. Nothing is quiet about that. For some of us, we're so driven by comparison that feeling like we need to do, have, and give our kids what everybody else has. But Jesus calls us to be focused on what he's given to us. It says to work with your hands. Don't expect everything to be given to you. What this teaches us is that we have something to contribute to the world around us. And if we live in this way, people who do not even believe in God will respect us. And can I tell you, I've seen this happen. When we were in New York and I was working for a financial tech company, and I, it was like my first week, and I was having a meeting with my team, and uh, people on my team were like, how did you end up here? And I shared my story of how we moved to New York City. We quit our jobs in Florida. We moved to New York City because we felt like that's what God was calling us to do. We didn't have a plan, per se. We were just trusting in God. And uh, I remember sharing this, and I knew that most of my team, if not all of my team, they weren't Christians. They didn't go to church. They didn't grow up in church. And, uh, And so as I'm sharing this stuff with them, I could see some of their faces like, this dude is an idiot who quits their job, moves to a city with no plan, and is engaged in planning a wedding. And I'll never forget this. There's a guy on my team who was the furthest thing from, just the furthest thing from God. And he comes up to me after this meeting, and he says, hey, man, I don't believe what you believe, but I just really respect the way that you live your life. And once I left that company to go pastor a church in New York City, uh, my last day, that same team that did not believe what I believe, but they respected the way that I was choosing to live my life, came to me and said, hey, where's your church? Can I come? Can I just want to, I want to see you do this, this thing that you talk about. Three of them end up coming to our church. All three of them end up giving their life to Jesus. And the reason I share that story is because, can I tell you, it didn't really have anything to do with what I said as much as it had everything to do with how I chose to live. And so what I want to do um, as we kind of wrap this up today is I want to give us four things that we can do for us and our kids to experience a materialism makeover. Four C's I want to give you today. The first one is this, commitment. Commitment. Look at what Matthew 5, verse 37, it says this, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. When we make a commitment, it's important to keep it. And when we say commitment, it's not just a yes, but it also means a no. Right? If you say you're going to do something or not do something, follow through on that. 
Commitment, whether it be a yes or a no, helps us to become steady, humble, and reliable people. The second C is this, it's contentment. Contentment. Look at what Galatians 6 verse 4, it says this, pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. You know, the biggest way to cultivate contentment is to, uh, to have a genuine gratitude for everything that you have. And a genuine gratitude for everything that you have means that you are grateful for even the things you don't like. It's hard to be grateful for the things in our life that we don't like. For some of us, that's our job. But man, can I tell you, in the world that we live in today, man, you better be grateful you have a job. And so what does it look like for you and your family and for those of us that have kids to have a regular rhythm of practicing gratitude and not just saying thank you, God, for the fun things, but thank you, God, even for the difficult things. Thank you, God, for the things that I don't really like right now, but I know they're providing for me. Thank you, God, for the things that, man, just feel normal and mundane and feel habitual, but, man, they matter to me. Right, And as you uh, practice and cultivate that gratitude in your life, what happens is you become so focused on what you do have that you don't have time for comparison. And no longer can comparison steal your joy. The third thing is this, contribute. Look at what 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12, it says this, even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. And all the parents are in the room. Y'all highlighting verse 10. Y'all going to use that with your kids, huh? Hey, remember? You ain't going to eat if you don't do no work. <laughs> Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. We were made to contribute. We were made to bring something to the world that we live in. Your kids were made to contribute to the world that they live in. I don't care how old they are. We got to stop believing that God can't use our kids right now. We got to stop believing that our kids are too young to be used by God in their own home, in their community, in their local church. But we got to help them understand that, no, there are some things that God has already put in you that you can make a difference now. You can contribute to this family. You can contribute to your community. You can contribute to your school. You can contribute to your neighbor's life. You can contribute to the world that you live in, and you don't have to wait. You don't have to be a certain age, but you can contribute. And when we teach our kids this, it imparts character. It develops character in them like nothing else can. The last C is this. It's connection. Look at what Hebrews 13, 5, it says this, don't love money, be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you, I will never abandon you. I find it so interesting that in a verse that tells us to not love money, to be content with what we have, that that sentence ends with us focusing on the truth that God will never leave us or abandon us. It highlights the importance of us being connected relationally, not just to God, but to the people in our life that we say matter. Our friends, our spouses and kids, they don't need us to buy them things. They need us to be with them. And so what does it look like for you and your family to prioritize connection with one another over consumption? And I think when it comes to faith and church, uh, sometimes what we do is we look at faith and we look at our relationship with, with God and we, we think that it's just all pick and choose. Like it's your favorite buffet that you get to go to and you get to put on your plate whatever you want to put on your plate. Can I tell you, that's not how it works. If you want to experience the fullness of God in your life, you have to practice the fullness of God in your life. And I think when it comes to these four C's, it's not picking which ones I want to do. No, no, you actually need all of them and they all feed into each other, right? So we talked about, we talked about commitment. Letting our yes be yes and our no be no, right? And really what is so powerful when we help our kids understand what it means to be committed to something, whether it's a yes or a no, what it teaches them is it, and it helps them to become reliable. 
And then we talked about contentment. Being grateful for what you have. And, and the power of contentment practice is it actually allows us to rest. Because when we aren't content with what we have, we are going to be on the endless rat race chasing the carrot that we will never get. It allows us to actually rest. And, and then we talked about contributing. What does that teach us and our kids? It teaches us that, man, there are things in this world, it's my responsibility. I don't know about you, but I've been in some church circles where it's like God's going to do everything. I just need to pray. I just need to show up. No, 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 no. There are some things that you need to actually put your hands to in partnership with God. Right? When it comes to contributing and understanding that you were made to contribute to the world around us, it means that there is a responsibility on you to do the thing that God has called you to do in the places that God has you. And if, if you don't do it, who's going to do it? It's our responsibility, right? It's my responsibility to contribute to my family, to my house, to contribute to my home, my wife, and my son. It's my responsibility to understand what God is calling me to contribute to my community. It's my responsibility to understand what God is calling me to contribute to the church that I call home. It's my responsibility to figure out how God is asking me to contribute to the world that I live in. It's no one else's responsibility, it's mine. And lastly, connection. When we understand connection, it strengthens our relationships. And we need all of these things, right? Because if we can teach our kids and ourselves to be committed, to let our yes be yes and our no be no, what it actually is helping us do is it's helping us focus. Not be thinking about a thousand different things, but to be focused on one thing. And what that does when it comes to contentment is it allows you to focus on the things that are most important, the things that matter. And you start to be grateful for small things. It's easy to be grateful for big things. But when you focus from being committed to the right things, it helps you to be grateful for every little thing that you have. And when you're grateful for every little thing that you have, can I tell you, there's an increased desire to want to contribute to something that is bigger than just you. And when you start to contribute to your home and your community and maybe your church and other things that are of value to you, what happens is naturally the relationships around you start to get stronger. And then it just continues to feed itself, right? Because as your relationships grow, as your community grows, you want to continue to contribute because you want to see other people experience what you've experienced. And as you contribute to, contribute to something, to be a part of something that's bigger than just you, it helps you to just continue to be grateful for what you have. And when you understand that, man, I got so much to be grateful for, the good, the bad, and the ugly, man, it's going to help me figure out what I need to say yes to, what I need to say no to, and follow through on those things. We need all of these things, not just some of them. And here's, here's why this matters. Could you imagine a world where preschool kids, elementary age kids, middle school kids, high school kids understood this? Could you imagine to see schools filled with kids that understood that their life was bigger than just them? That God had a purpose and a plan for them to contribute, to make a difference in the world, and all it took for them was to understand how to say yes and how to say no, how to be grateful for what they had, understanding that they have something to give to this world and that relationships matter. Imagine what our world would look like. But if we want our kids to get there, guess who has to get there first? Us. But what this cultivates in our world is radical generosity. Because at the core of these four things, it's about people and it's about relationship. It's not about stuff. And notice that you can do all of these things regardless of what you have. And so as the worship team comes back to join me, here's what we want to 
encourage you to practice in your life. Spend time with people who reinforce your values and set limits on whatever causes you to compromise. Spend time with people who reinforce your values and set limits on whatever causes you to compromise. Can I invite you to stand as I pray for us today? Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. And God, I thank you that you are the greatest example of all of these things. God, that you are more committed to us than we will ever be committed to you, that you are the most reliable thing that we have in our life, that we can find true rest in you. And you model that for us. You model what it means to be grateful for what you have, the cards that maybe you've been dealt. You model for us what it means to contribute, to have a purpose that's bigger than just us. And you did it all so that we could be in relationship with you. And so, Father, as we take a moment to just reflect, I pray that you would speak to us, you would show us maybe what needs to look different in our life, in our home, maybe what needs to change, maybe what needs to grow or get deeper. And as you bring awareness, would you give us the courage to be obedient, to do what you're asking us to do? We love you. We bless you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that he's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and Abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because a Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that he can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.